You picture your newborn child as being able to do anything. But those hopes and dreams for Matthew became limited very quickly. We were dealing with a life or death situation. Matthew was born by C-section, which meant that I stayed in the hospital for three days or, or so. Matthew had been such a hard fought for baby. It was really a, a remarkable feeling of aliveness and joy. When we were discharged from the hospital, they said, you know, we'd really like you to see a cardiologist right away. The next day we went into the cardiology office. He did an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the heart for Matthew. The cardiologist got very quiet. He turned to us and said, Matthew has hypoplastic left heart. You know, Sharon immediately burst into tears. And of course, I, I didn't know what it meant. I was crying too hard to be able to tell him. It was so unbelievable. Simply put, if you have hypoplastic left heart syndrome, or what we call HLHS, you're born with half a heart. Prior to the 1990s, the vast majority of children that were born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome died. When I started to put the pieces together, I was really just truly in disbelief that this, um, that this couldn't be happening to us. The cardiologist gave us three options. He said, we can make him comfortable until he passes away. We can try and get him on the list for an infant heart transplant. And then the third was a set of three staged surgeries. As soon as we were presented the options, we knew it was very clear that we were gonna do everything that we possibly could. Oh, I remember that moment of handing him over as just excruciating. Matthew was the first generation of children to undergo the new operation. The first operation is the most complex operation that we do. It is the highest risk, it has the highest mortality. He was in the intensive care unit for probably about three or four days. It's hard to reconcile that image of a baby in the bed, not responsive and quite puffy and so on because of all the fluids and things. It doesn't look like your child. The two weeks that we were there for Matt's first surgery were just a whirlwind. But we got through it, and we were able to come home with Matthew. The next surgery was six months later. In that period of time in between those two surgeries, his blood oxygen levels were very low. I mean, he was purple, which is what happens when you don't have enough blood oxygen. But then his oxygen levels started to dip more. His cardiologist said, I think we're gonna have to move up his surgery. I would say on you know, on the one hand, it was easier because we we had a sense of you know what we were gonna be dealing with. And on the other hand, it was tougher because we had bonded with Matthew more and he had more awareness of what was happening to him. Matthew grew and turned into a little toddler and learned to walk and we learned to chase him. It was us jogging down the hallway with this little, you know, with this whole contraption behind him and an IV pole half the time it was hand in hand. When the third surgery came, of course we were you know, worried. There's a huge amount of fear because we just didn't know that whether Matthew would survive or not. Matthew Langer. I'm a 22-year-old mechanical engineering college student with a heart condition. The hardest part was just having to compare yourself to others, but personally it's, you know, I've never known what it's like to be able to walk up a couple flights of stairs and not get winded.
Well, there's a good chance Matthew's going to need a heart transplant down the line. And we don't think about it every day. And I don't think he does. You know, if and when that happens, we hope that medical science will be even more advanced. More than half these patients will have significant heart failure, and many will need heart transplants in the first two decades of life. And what we're finding now is even more required transplants in the third or fourth decade. The American Heart Association has been, is currently, and will be the key catalyst, the key driver for how we develop the best science, the best clinical programs, and the best advocacy to help children like Matthew and his family. I really believe that the AHA has funded the research that has allowed Matthew to live. It kind of feels like science fiction, what, like the fact that I'm alive, especially the fact that I wouldn't have been alive if I were born you know, probably you know, 15 years earlier. I graduate next year. I hope to work in aerospace, and I'm, I'm excited about being able to work on something that I really enjoy. We don't know when or if he's going to need more intervention. We presume that he will. We hope just to buy him time until the research and advancements in the field are such that his next step will be a much easier one.